Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margaret Ann Mitchell. I'm the Dean of the Divinity School and a Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature. On behalf of the faculty of the Divinity School and also my colleague uh, Clark Gilpin, the director of the Martin Marty Center, um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this conference, Characterizing Astrology in the Medieval Islamic World. Our conference organizers have written a very elegant and uh, careful uh, description, which I will read to orient our minds as we get started. This conference will use the particular case study of astrology as a means to study the broader implications of boundary work. It will examine the intersections among science, the occult, and the religious cultures that lived in the medieval Islamic world, including Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism. The conference hopes to complicate the categories of magic, science, and religion by looking at how boundaries between these fields were articulated by medieval scholars. Boundary work, by its very nature, is interdisciplinary. The conference will bring together scholars of religious studies, history, sociology, art, and science studies to collectively examine the chosen case study of astrology. By looking at practices of, categorizations of, and debates surrounding astrology in the medieval Islamic world, the conference hopes to shed light on the broader questions of when, where, why, and how definitions and boundaries are established between science, magic, and religion. It is my pleasure especially to welcome uh, uh, an erudite and accomplished field of international scholars to the University of Chicago for this conference. Um, Raymond Leicht from Hebrew University, Matthew Melvin Cushy from the University of South Carolina, Professor Daniel Stoltz from our neighbor, Northwestern University, Noah Gardner from the University of Michigan, uh, Marla Segal from SUNY at Buffalo, Enrico Raffaelli from the University of Toronto, Josefina Rodriguez Arribas from Airline in Nuremberg, Ahmed Tunch uh, Shen from the University of Chicago, local, Terry Gee from uh, Brigham Young University, Robert Morrison from Bowdoin College, and Godefroy de Canatai from uh, Université Catholique de Louvain. In addition, we have a really marvelous group of graduate student uh, respondents to papers, um, one of the really lovely designs of our conference organizers. And I just want to name them as well. Francesca Chubb Confer from the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Chandra Levelt, a uh, master's student in the Divinity School uh, here at Chicago. Edwin Haynes from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Jessica Andrus, University of Chicago Divinity School. Muhammad Ballin from the Department of History. Nora Jacobson Ben Hamed, also from the Divinity School. Yoni Shemesh from the Divinity School. And Elizabeth Sartell. And I especially want to uh, lead all of us in thanking our conveners for uh, such an expert job of uh, both uh, the vision behind this conference, the ambition uh, that uh, led to such a marvelous program, and your skillful and gracious execution. So to Chandra Lamouk and Elizabeth Sartell, our thank you. also ought to thank uh, Professors James Robinson and Ali Reza Dustar for uh, being faculty uh, um, uh, leaders and guide guides to this conference as well. So Professor Dustar and Professor Robinson, thank you. So yesterday afternoon around this time, as I started to pull my notes together to welcome you, I looked on the schedule and I saw Welcome address by the team of the Divinity School with a 30 minute allotment. And I thought, oh, welcome address. Normally I say welcome and then I sit down and get to enjoy uh, the conference. Um, but uh, the conference organizers asked me to say a few words and I will do so and I hope in a manner that is helpful to focus our attention. As I said, I'm a scholar of ancient Christianity. 
So I come to this inquiry about uh, medieval Islamic uh, astrology from the early imperial Roman period, roughly the first to the fourth centuries, where the issues around which this conference has been organized were already very much up for debate. As we know, I think, the matrix produced by the combination of profundity and the protean nature of classical and Hellenistic Greek thought and its appropriations and resistances in emergent Jewish, Christian, and Islamic cultures of late antiquity is a key element in the seedbed for the medieval Islamic world that you engage in your work and in this conference in particular. And after all, the word astrology is a Greek term, astrologia. But lexicography doesn't exactly solve all of our issues. Uh, when I turn to the Dell Scott Jones, the premier lexicon for Greek, uh, I find astrologia, gloss number one, astronomy, dot, 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 a branch of mathematics. And then gloss number two, later, astrology. <laughs> So um, it had to live long enough to become its own cognate. Um, so only later is it astro astrology. Herein lies a complex of issues. Astrology is linked with astronomy, with cosmology, physics, mathematics, chronometry, which is, after all, one building block of history or historiography, meteorology, and yet also magic divination, stargazing, sky mapping, fortune telling, religion, magic, sciences, as well as the perpetual tension, I would say, between philosophy and rhetoric as forms of human knowing and representation. And the, that representation is also multimedia, including the visual rhetorics, for example, of the signs of the zodiac. Uh, which we find all over the ancient world, um, including in Jewish synagogues in the Galilee and elsewhere, interestingly enough. Ancient astrology and medieval Islamic astrological arguments and reflections, from what I can see in the abstracts of the excellent papers for this conference, embodies the tension between the visible and the occluded, the obvious and the occult, observation and inquiry, ancient and contemporary, knowledge and technique, in Greek terms, episteme and techne. Now, astrology also has its own geographical histories, which in the ancient Mediterranean world often pointed east in a rather romantic sensibility in some cases, um, in a suspicious one in others, pointed east to the sources of astrology, and its ambiguously evaluated proficience. For example, the Chaldeans, um, perhaps associated in some context with the Babylonians, and their oracular talents, uh, as mentioned in the book of Daniel and the Hebrew Bible and elsewhere. The Magi, the old Persians, with their star in the Gospel of Matthew that marks the birth of the infant-born king of the Jews. Ancient and late antique astrology is not only situated on an east-west or horizontal terrestrial axis, but also fundamentally on a vertical one, on the assumption that there is some, and in Greek writers it's sympathia or sympaste, that there is some sympathy <coughs> between the heavens above and the earth below. And the goal of astrology is to map, comprehend, and above all, anticipate the effects of that sympathy or co-experience between the heavenly and the earthly for individual births, for the lives that will ensue, as well as those of collectives and nations. I would add as well, as I was thinking about this, that astrology is also situated at the nexus of human hope and credulity, on the one hand, and doubt and skepticism, on the other. So naturally I turned to one of my favorite ancient authors, Sextus Empiricus, who in his work against the professors addresses a treatise to each of six types of knowledge. Grammarians, rhetoricians, geometricians, arithmeticians, 
astrologers as number five, and then musicians after the astrologers. Sextus terms the work of astrology, what he calls it, he kaldaike methodos, he calls it the Chaldean method. And he names two conventional arguments against astrology. And this is in the, Sextus wants to say there's no possibility for knowledge of any kind whatsoever, but then he addresses darts at different kinds of knowledge. The reason there can't be such a thing as astrology is, number one, Things on Earth are neither sympathetic with one another, nor are they able to be sympathetic with things in the heavens. So it's a twofold argument. There's no sympathia below, so it can't be with the heavens, but there also isn't sympathia, uh, an absolute sympathia between the earthly and the heavenly. Secondly, he says, this is a basic argument everybody uses, he says, sexist uh, allows, astrology could only work if everything that happened, happened by destiny or fate, uh, however you translate that. But we know it's not true that everything happens by destiny. Some things happen by necessity, anake, some happen by chance, chike, and some happen by human action. And so he says, absolutely, if not everything is according to haimamene, then there can be no such thing as astrology. But Sextus himself never likes to take the easy path. And so he says these are the easy ways to shoot astrology down out of the sky. Um, he says, but he instead will try to destroy the very conceptualization and actualization of the horoscope itself. And that's where he aims his arrows. But the fact that he includes astrology alongside the other knowledge systems and, uh, um, and forms of teaching of his day unwittingly testifies to astrology's assumed position of importance alongside arithmetic, alongside rhetoric and grammar, alongside music. So, from the second century to the medieval Islamic world, these debates for and against, hope versus skepticism, confidence versus uh, uh, lack of trust, these debates continue along both similar and I think quite divergent lines as the papers of this conference will show. So it is time to let the conversation begin with Sextus and Puritus as our uh, first, uh, first guide. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you James T. Robinson, Associate Professor of the History of Judaism and of Islamic Studies in the Divinity School, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Welcome to the conference. Thank you, Dean Mitchell. Uh, you are a half hour uh, for your introductory remarks. I don't appear on stage. So, uh, I would have to say that I can to introduce uh, Professor Rudd quickly and uh, set us on our way. First of all, I wanted to add accommodation to uh, Elizabeth Sartell and Chandra Lamotte, who did a wonderful job in organizing everything related to this conference. They have brought us here, and hopefully, uh, in a few minutes, uh, Professor Mike will then take us forward. So, I want to add to So it is my privilege uh, now to introduce our first speaker, the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Raymond Leik from the Hebrew University. Professor Leik is the senior lecturer in the Faculty of Humanities in the Department of Jewish Thought and also the Program for the History, Philosophy and Sociology of Now and Sociology of Sciences. Um, he is the head of the Program for the History, Philosophy and Sociology of Sciences as well. Professor Leik is the author of a one might say the foundational book in the study of Jewish astrology, Astrologumina Judaica, studies on the history of the astrological literature of the Jews. Uh, he is also, uh, and this is worth mentioning, it, mentioning as well, the editor of a very uh, innovative online electronic project focused on medieval Hebrew technical terminology called Shah. And uh, it is uh, uh, progressing quite wonderfully and is accessible online for anyone who wants to explore this site, which gives Hebrew um, uh, technical terms from philosophy and science from the Middle Ages. 
So um, tonight, Professor Wright will be speaking on characterizing astrology in the Arab Muslim world. Uh, all that remains now is for me to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jim. Thank you, uh, Marvin Mitchell, for, for the kind words. Thank you, first of all, for Chandra and Elizabeth for the organization of this wonderful conference. Very promising, very rich in themes. Dear colleagues, dear friends. It's really an enormous pleasure for me and uh, an honor to open this conference about characterizing astrology in the medieval Islamic world. In a way, I have to admit that I have stolen this title from the organizers of this conference, perhaps with a slight uh, it's significant modification. But the idea of speaking about how to characterize astrology in a specific religious, cultural, and linguistic context, the medieval Muslim Arab world, simply appeared to me so appropriate for an opening session that I simply could not withstand the temptation to commit this uh, little intellectual theft. What might serve me as a kind of excuse is that I have a personal relation to two of the, two of the key terms in this title, which is characterized astrology. Um, if I look at my own uh, biography, my own interest in astrology has actually grown quite randomly out of uh, what is more a kind of coincidence. I've been working for many, many years in a research project on Jewish magic from the Cairo Elisa, and I was looking for a new research uh, project and I found out that there are so many astrological texts in the Cairo Elisa from different different contexts that would be worth studying them because there are plenty of parallels in other Jewish manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts, and there are also numerous par parallels in non-Jewish material. So, so I, I started to, um, to embark on this research project which ultimately uh, led to this uh, book, the Astrologumina Judaica, which is a kind of attempt to write a few chapters of the history of Jewish astrological literature. Ever since the publication of this book, however, my name is always associated with astrology, and I'm afraid that I will never get rid of this uh, title of being an astrologer. For example, when a senior colleague of mine at the Hebrew University Press introduces me and any occasion you always said, well, we also have Raymond here who is dealing with astrology, not really with the um, outspoken disregard of what I'm doing, but still with a tiny little undercurrent saying, well, quite surprising what these younger guys are interested in, not really serious things like Maimonides or the Zohar or, or things like that, but astrology. So, um, that's where I stand, and the good thing is, of course, that uh, this voluntary or involuntary characterization brought me here to Chicago for the first time in my life, and I'm very grateful for that. And it gives me, it gives me the opportunity to attend this interesting, fascinating conference. And perhaps uh, I can be at least confident that if there are people out there in the world who think that I am best characterized by the term astrology, I'm not totally wrong here at this place, and that might be a good starting point to give a paper on characterizing astrology in the Muslim Arab world. The chosen, or as I've said, rather stone type of her paper is, of course, ambiguous from the outset. And it can be read in two different ways. It can either refer to the question as to how we, as modern students of the history of medieval Islam, can or should try to characterize astrology as a historical and cultural phenomenon, or we can read it as a research program with the target of finding out in which different ways astrology was in fact characterized in different contexts within the medieval Arab Muslim world itself. These aspects cannot and should not be totally separated from one another, and in the best case, the ethic and emic perspective inform each other. But here, as in many other parts of cultural studies, it is also worth paying attention to this tiny little difference. In the main part of my talk, I will try to discuss a few aspects of the emic discourse about the proper characterization of astrology, with a special focus on the Bricker Arabic translation movement and the perception of astrology among Aristotelian philosophers. But let me first say a few things, a few other things, which perhaps belong a little bit more to the ethic perspective. It is a widely accepted assumption that astrology was an important, an import, an innovation in the classical Muslim Arab world if we compare it to, let's say, pre Islamic Arabia or the primitive Islamic culture. This assumption, however, requires some qualification. 
Although it is undoubtedly true that the large-scale production of astronomical literature in the Arabic language does not predate the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, and that astrology became a matter of scholarly dispute and discourse in the cultural realm dominated by Islam only afterwards. But we have to keep in mind that Islam spread into a geographical region where astrology was present and alive since centuries, Iraq, Persia, Egypt, and so on. Even if we have very little reliable information as to which degree the pre-Islamic Arabian Peninsula itself was influenced by this common Middle Eastern cultural heritage, can we call the astrological koine. Gothic Fahd, classical study the Divination Arabe, Études Religieuses, Sociologie et Folklorique sur le milieu natif de l'Islam, which uh, came out in Leiden in 1966, is a major attempt to trace certain divinatory practices, among them also astrology, back into early Arabic culture, pre Islamic culture, early Islamic culture. But the book, rich as it is in its material and scope, suffers from so many methodological deficits that it is difficult to reconstruct a reliable and adequate picture from this. But even if we take it now and argue that astrology was in fact a more recent import or an innovation in the Muslim Arab world, I think that we still have to bear in mind that we subsume under this broad heading um, at least three different categories of things, of theories and practice. And I think we really have to keep these things apart. First, popular astrology, which means astrological predictions about individual place and, quite importantly, also astrometeorology, predictions of weather and, and, and as a result of it, economical developments, based upon, at any rate, predicted based upon very simple methods and written down mostly in very, very short readings, what I've called in my book, Klein Literatur. Secondly, we had the learned scientific astrology in the tradition of the great humanistic astrologers, like Ptolemy and Perotheus and so on. And thirdly, we had astromagic, talismanic art and so on, which means theories and practices generally connected with Hermeticism and the Sidians. In this respect, one even could add another aspect which is different from astromagic in a sense. We have lots of astrology also in magic itself, the popular magic, which uh, says, for example, that you have to, to, to carry out a certain magical act when they, under the full moon or on a special day and so on. But that's not what, uh, what we actually normally associate with astromagic. Um, if one would like to present a full panorama of the reception of astrology in Muslim Arab culture, one could probably and should probably have to add other forms for the reception of astrology. Astrology in the letter, uh, in arts, in Quran exegesis. But, but let us take these three branches as a point of departure. Each of them reveals specific characteristics. The second category, learned scientific astrology, perhaps fits the typical and expected characteristics we associate with art astrology in the Muslim Arab, Arab world best. That is, that it was an important innovation to stir limited disputes among scholars, scientists, and theologians about how to characterize the science, if it was one, if it was a science, and about how to, how to determine its religious, theological, legal, and scientific status and balance. On the other hand, I have already pointed out that it's doubtful to which extent the texts of the first category, popular astrology, were at all an innovation in the relevant uh, geographical regions or geocultural regions. And, at least to the best of my knowledge, this kind of astrological text never became object of a meta discourse. It seems to me that one even could cast doubts on whether this kind of pharma almanacs and, and so on was indeed always considered to be astrology at all in the proper sense of the word by both, the actual users and professional astrologers and their uh, critics uh, alike. Finally, astromagic is again a quite different issue because there are certain particularities in the discourse about astromagic and also in the practice which are totally absent from judicial astrology. For example, this aspect of connections to idol worship, the cult of demons on the one hand, but also its systematic place within natural philosophy uh, as a kind of organic device. So this also has to be kept apart. So astrology in the Muslim Arab world designates at least three different things, but 
as you probably know, the, the need for differentiations uh, does not really come to an end here. Another as aspect which needs to be taken into consideration is that speaking about the Muslim Arab world means speaking about many, many different regional and religious cultures and subcultures in which the reception of astrology took place and the development of it also. Sunni Islam, Shi'i Islam, Coptic Christians, Syrian Christians, Jewish, Jews, Mandeans, Persians, Remnants, <coughs> Pagan, Paganism, all living, developing, and sometimes even prospering under the roof of the dominant Arab Muslim culture. This is sometimes also called Islamic well, The study of astrology in medieval Islam, Muslim, Arab, or Islamic at all, uh, thus covers a wide panorama of different topics and involves numerous disciplines that range from folklore to cultural history, from theology to the history of science, from history of literature to arts, uh, and arts to theology and philosophy. I'm saying all this not so much in order to create the impression of a certain omnipresence of astrology in the medieval Islamic world. Although it is undoubtedly true that astrology fulfilled a much more important role than, than it does today. But rather to make clear that modern scholars can talk about quite different things when they talk about astrology and its reception in the Muslim Arab world. And historically speaking, for example, a verdict against astrology in the sense of astromagic did not necessarily also entail one against popular pharma almanacs, and doubts regarding the scientific possibility or value of astro astromagic does not automatically, is not automatically relevant for scientific horoscopic astrology and vice versa. So no wonder that also this conference will be in itself characterized by papers dealing with quite different aspects of astrology. As far as I can see, we will hear rather little about the reception or diffusion and uh, development of popular astrology in the Muslim Arab world. But we will, we will hear a lot and very, very many important and interesting things about the interconnection between astrology and the history of science, technology, and philosophy by Matthew uh, Melvin Kushki, by Josefina Rodriguez Arribas on uh, the, the astrologs, by Terry E. In, uh, astrology and astronomy in Abu Mashar and what why the Kalatai um, about the Ikhwana Safa. We will hear about the interconnection between astrology and magic by Noah Gardner, who is going to speak about Albuni, uh, Ahmed Shen, who is going to speak about uh, talismans in the Ottoman Empire. And we, we will hear a lot about the interconnection between the Muslim Arab culture and other subcultures in the Islamic world by Marla Segal, who is going to speak about Jewish connections to astrology in the setting of Iran, and then Robert Faeli, who is going to speak about the Russian text, Robert Morrison, about astro astrology as Jewish philosophy. But let me come back to the topic of my paper, characterizing astrology in the Arab Muslim world. Obviously, I will now, not after what I've said, a minute ago, try to give you a really comprehensive characterization of what astrology meant in Jewish, uh, in the Muslim Arab culture. But I will rather concentrate on one specific aspect which seems to me of special interest. The question of how scholars in the Muslim Arab world who were in contact, somewhat, somewhat connected, to the translation movement from Greek, partly by Assyria and Pahlavi, into Arabic how they characterized astrology and located it within this vast realm of newly acquired scientific knowledge, and how these ways of characterization influenced the role of astrology, the role of astrology played in different intellectual discourses. If we go back to antiquity, it seems to me that the disciplinary dis separation which existed largely between the philosophical schools on the one hand, and the professional training of astrologers and other professionals, medical doctors on the other, prevented that a more systematic discussion about the place of astrology among the sciences took place. On the other hand, the specific modes and circumstances of the reception of astrological knowledge in the Muslim Arab world, together with philosophy and the other Greek sciences, like medicine, created an imminent need among the scholars involved to rethink and rewrite, re rewrite the inherent models for catalogs of systems of classifications of the sciences, 
and to reach a deeper understanding of what actually uh, what astrology actually is and where to make and locate it within this vast corpus of acquired knowledge. Consequently, we owe to the Arabs not only the transmission and development of these sciences, but also the most thoroughgoing discussions about their scientific character, and that especially vis a vis the Aristotelian theory of sciences and physics. In that respect, we will see that although astrology, similar to medicine or magic, alchemy, was often considered to be a science, it would be much of an oversimplification to believe that these branches of human knowledge were seen as Wissenschaften wie jeder andere Science like any other, as Manfred Ullmann puts it in the introduction to his classical handbook Medizin in Islam, which he published in 1970. Assuredly, Ullmann's intention in 1970 was very positive and laudable. He wanted to overcome the traditional disdain of Western research for pseudosciences like astrology, magic, gemstones, and so on. Um, and he tried in, the, in his books, and actually two books which he wrote on medicine and on occult sciences, to give them a more appropriate place in modern scholarship and in our image of the uh, development of sciences in the Muslim Arab world. There is, however, according to my opinion, another side of the story. As a matter of fact, whatever studies the history of astrology will see that astrology, in fact, was always more problematic than the other sciences, that it was discussed more intensively than the other sciences, and that is perhaps, historically speaking, this is the most fascinating side of astrology. As you probably all know, the Greek Arab translation movement, which has served me now as a starting point for my talk, led ultimately to the systematic integration and appropriation of almost the complete scientific library of late antiquity and early Byzantine culture and literature, which uh, the Arabs inherited from the classical period, uh, including astrology. I find it quite remarkable, however, that a certain shift of paradigms, if you want to say, regarding the place of astrology within this translation movement occurred between the earlier studies and the more recent approach. As far as I can see, all the earlier studies on the Greek or Arabic translation, uh, translations by scholars like Max Meyerhoff or uh, Gottlieb Bergstresser generally took it for granted that it was in the first place the interest in Greek medicine, which uh, and perhaps secondly in astronomy, that was the initial trigger not only for the production of scientific Arabic scientific literature in these two different fields, but for the translation movement as a whole. So they were studying them philosophy actually in order to understand medicine and so on. Scholars more interested in the history of philosophy sometimes are simply more philosoph centric and forget to speak about other sciences altogether. But even among these scholars, you can find people like Nicholas Rescher, for example, the, the, the father of uh, the study of Arab uh, logic who uh, full-heartedly adopts the chronological and systematic priority of medical studies among the Arabs um, to the beginning of the study of other disciplines like philosophy and, uh, and logic. The other scholars are a little bit less clear cut in their opinion. They broaden the focus and seem to assume that astrology, medicine, alchemy together were perhaps some of the starting point for the translation movement in the other period. And this is mainly based upon a historical report found in al Jahis and in Anadim to the effect that the Umayyad, Umayyad Prince Khalid bin Yazid, who died in 7704, seems to have been the first Muslim to, to order translations of such, such books. More recently, however, Dimitri Gutes, in his epochal book, Greek Thought, Arabic Culture, the Greco Arabic translation movement in Baghdad in an early Abbasid society which came out in 1988, um, he assumed a very unambiguous stance and explicitly argues that it, it was in fact astrology and nothing else than astrology that had the, not only had the chronological priority in the translation movement, but also a systematic one. Take, for example, page one of this book, where he is writing about the enormous amount of translations produced during the Abbasid period in a rather short period of time. And there he says, what this means 
I quote, what this means is that all of the following Greek writings, other than exceptions that I've mentioned here, he's referring to literature, uh, to, to literary texts, we have, we have reached, um, which have reached us from Hellenistic, Roman, and late Antiqu antiquity times, and many more um, that had not survived in the original Greek were subjected to the transformative power of the translator's pen. Astrology and alchemy and the rest of occult sciences, the subjects of the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and the theory of music, the entire field of Aristotelian philosophy throughout its history, metaphysics, ethics, physics, zoology, botany, and especially logic, the organon, all the health sciences, medicine, pharmacology, and veterinary sciences, and various other marginal general genres of writing, such as Byzantine handbooks of military science, the tactical, popular collections of wisdom sayings, and even books on falconry, all these subjects pass the hands of the translator. The order of subjects, end of quote, the order of subjects headed by astrology long before Aristotelian philosophy is not accidental here. Astrology needs to be mentioned first because it was the first things that were translated. And it becomes very clear from what Buddha says in his, the same book, for example, about the beginning of the movement under the Caliph al-Mansur, and who reigned from 754 to 755. By all accounts, Buddha says, by all accounts, astrology was a field for which there was no practical need, and indeed the one which stood at the center of al-Mansur's imperial ideology. It was not only, Buddha goes on to write, the practical need for a strong astrological history, as is discussed a little bit earlier, or for horoscopy and the other parts of astrology that made it predominant in the concerns of the first scholars of the Abbasid court. Alongside, or rather because of the practical needs served by astro astrological history and horoscopy, astrology was viewed in the eyes of the scholars as the mistress of all sciences. And here, Buddha is referring us to a certain Theophilos of Edessa, who died in 70, 785, who was a court astrologer of the Caliph. Astrology characterized as the mistress of all sciences. If this characterization of astrology was, was true, this would be, of course, quite good news for this conference and for all the participants of this conference and for every, anybody who is working on astrology, because it was really reassures that we have to get lots of uh, research grants in the field of astrology and it's an Arab world. I have to admit that to a certain extent, although I, I like this characterization and it supports the, the field of research which I'm loving myself, I still have some reservations about this far-reaching interpretation. Because I'm not totally sure whether the general approach of Guta's book does not dictate and actually predetermine the result of this analysis. Because he himself uh, says at the beginning of the book that he tries to, or wants, which is to investigate the major, I put, the major social, political, and ideological factor that occasioned the translation movement. And for that reason, he was actually looking for the material or really practical factor that occasioned this movement rather than doing intellectual history. And astrology, as a practical science, seems to be a good target for this. Moreover, one could also cast doubts on the very concept of uh, being able to pinpoint one specific discipline, scientific discipline, at the sole trigger for the translation movement as a whole. How could one prove this? I'm not really sure about this, but this is not the topic of my paper. <coughs> but irrespective, the question of the absolute or relative priority there can be little doubt that from a historical point of view, astrology, both in its popular and its more sophisticated forms, was already there when the large-scale reception of Aristotelian philosophy and other Greek sciences reached one of its peaks from the 9th century onwards. Unfortunately, we possess relatively little evidence of any kind of meta-discourse during the early period, which can be called some of the dark first century of the reception of Hellenistic astrology in the Muslim Arab world. Disputes between Mutazilite theologians and astrologers on the issue of determinism seem to have taken place, as we can learn from certain documents settled by, by uh, von S. in his uh, famous Theologie und Gesellschaft in Zweiten und Dritten Jahrhundert der Hitler. And Fuad Zizkin, the great historian of Arabic literature of the 20th century, 
believe that the earliest Arabic works discussing the scientific, scientific truth and reliability of astrology were in fact composed as early as the 8th century. But unfortunately, it provides very little complete evidence for this assumption. On the other hand, the first properly documented scholarly discourse about astrology can be dated only to the mid 9th century, when Akindi, the philosopher of the Arabs, who died in 873, and his student, Abu Masha Abati, who died in 886, apparently did not only embark on disputes with contemporary opponents of astrology, possibly a certain Ali, um, Ali ibn Isa al-Asmurlabi, but, and I think more importantly, made serious attempts to integrate astrology into the system of Aristotelian science as they understood it in order to allot for astrology a proper place in the system of science. The fascinating process of what can be called the phase of the phase of the Aristotelian interpretation and appropriation of astrology in the Akindi circle, and especially by Akindi's disciple Abu Masha, which I've mentioned before, has already attracted the, the attention of several scholars in the past. I should mention here, of course, the Charles Mays, the important book Abu Masha and the Latin Aristotelianism in the 12th century, the rediscovery of Aristotle's natural philosophy through Arabic astrology, which came out in Beirut in 1962, in which Limay strongly emphasizes Abu Masha's dependence upon both Aristotle's physics and his philosophy of science. The book was totally heartbreaking, even among students of Islamic history, although it is based exclusively on, on Latin sources, he reads only Latin, and is totally written from the perspective of, of a medieval Latinist who is interested in the impact of this book uh, in, on, 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 on the development of, uh, of philosophy in, in the Middle Ages. Um, where he actually argues that very similar to what happened with Abu Bashar in, uh, in the Arab world, also in the Latin world we have a, a astrology as a starting point for the interest in Aristotle's natural philosophy um, and, uh, and, and the, the subsequent development actually needs to be interpreted from this background. But there are also other scholars who were fascinated by this phenomenon. Only one year after the May, Rokhun Baidel published a long article on Abu Masha's defense of astrology, and about a decade ago, Peter Addison published a paper in which he largely follows, on the one hand, the May's interpretation of Abu Masha's Aristotelianism, but also highlights the latest close contact or dependence upon the philosophical system of al -Kin. I think we will hear more about Abu Masha later on this conference from uh, Terry. Um, but I still would like to mention a few points here which seem important to my topic, the characterization of astrology in the early phase of the Greek and Roman translation movement. What seems to me remarkable in Akindi's and Abu Masha's interpretation of astrology and characterization are two things. First, <coughs> these two thinkers somehow considered astrology to be not only and not even primarily practical science closely associated with astronomy, but they interpreted it as an inseparable part of Aristotelian physics. As it is well known, Aristotle believed that the stars, and especially the sun, play an important role as a kind of motor of the processes which are going on in the sublunary sphere, but he nowhere systematically elaborates on this theory. Now, both Akindi and Abu Masha tried to fill this gap, actually this uh, systematic gap that exists in the corpus Aristotelicum, um, sorry, um, and argued that it is the astrological teachings inherited from the Greeks which do provide an appropriate scientific explanation for the functioning of the physical processes observable in the sublunary realm, in the world of generation and corruption. Following this theory, they characterize astrology not only as a science with an enormous practical value, but they conceive it as the highest of all physical sciences because it provides a theoretical foundation for Aristotelian physics. And here we might hear echoes of the, the, the characterization of astrology as the mistress of all sciences, which Buddha uh, quotes from uh, Theophilus of Edessa. Concomitantly, and secondly, the scholars of this circle 
made considerable efforts to present astrology as an empirical science based on tajriba, on experience, in accordance with a certain understanding of the Aristotelian theory of science. This aspect was also mentioned by Peter Adamson in his aforementioned article, but I think that he is not sufficiently aware of certain difficulties that arise from this, uh, this topic. When he tries, Adamson tries, to interpret Abu Mashar and Akili from the background of Aristotle's theory of Episteme as developed in the Analytica Posteriora, he should have paid more attention to, do, to, to two difficult points. First, personally, I think there are very few points where the Analytica Posteriora are indeed referred to in, the, in their literature. And secondly, there's actually a wide scholarly agreement that this is Aristotelian text. The Analytica Posteriora, which display Aristotle's theory of science, was translated and studied among Arab thinkers only from about one century later, starting with al farabi in the 9th century. Therefore, my personal impression is that Achilles and Abu Masha's model for the epistemological foundations of astrology as an empirical science, including all, all kinds of technical aspects, including like, the description of how astrologers collected their, their knowledge empirically and accumulatively, and how they built from this universal premises, is much more reminiscent, I think, of an empiricist reading of the first chapters of Aristotle's Metaphysica, uh, Alpha Meta and Alpha Elata, the first and the second book of the Metaphysics as we know it. More reminiscent of that than of the analytical posterior. This, in a way, unfortunately poses new problems because uh, the first of the Metaphysica Alpha is also believed to have reached the Arabs only much later. But I tend to agree with a uh, few more recent studies that seem to indicate the existence of an earlier translation of the metaphysics, a Aleph, Alpha, that was known and used by Akini. And I think that this text actually formed the theoretical framework for the conception of astrology as an Aristotelian science in the Akini circle. But be this as it may, it is quite interesting to see how astrology became at this early stage in the history of, Muslim Arab, of the Muslim Arab appropriation of Greek science a cornerstone of physical theory and was conceived of as an empirical science par excellence. Accordingly, there are clear indications that it was seen as part of theoretical science rather than practical or poetic sciences. There are certain references in the Mutrail of Abu uh, which can be, can be interpreted like that. It is regrettable that we do not possess a complete work of Alkindi or any of his disciples on the classification of the formal classification of the sciences, because this treatise on the quantity of Aristotle's book is in fact really only more a book on Aristotle's organon, um, um, corpus Aristotelicum, rather than on, uh, on the sciences as a whole. But there can be no doubt that astrology would have given a central position. As we will see, this early and promising marriage between Aristotelian, Aristotelian philosophy and astrology was to come to an end very, very soon. But it seems quite important to me not to under, underestimate this chapter in the history of the of Muslim Arab astrology, because I think it is indispensable, or the indispensable background for a proper understanding of astrology's fate in later generations. More than just serving as a strategy to defend astrology against its opponents, the characterization of astrology as a purely founded science of nature, which was formulated in the 9th century, turned it into a crucial supplement to, of Aristotelian, Aristotelian physics. Accordingly, Achilles and Abu Masha's understanding of astrology is probably better described as a systematic and constructive one rather than merely a projected one. Astrology not only enjoyed some kind of chronological priority, but became a constitutive part of the new scientific role. If you are looking from this point at the later development, you will no longer see <coughs> the later development of processes of a gradual appropriation of astrology, gradual uh, attempts to, to, to understand and learn more of astrology in the Arab um, Muslim culture, but rather as a period of gradual retreat from this first period of uh, enthusiastic reception. 
What followed after the grandiose event of astrology in the Muslim Arab intellectual world was in fact a long, long period full of attempts from various sides to limit and top downgrade the scientific aspirations, aspirations of astrology and marginalize, marginalize its role in the context of earth Aristotelian science. <coughs> so what happened with astrology in the decades and centuries after the heydays of astrolog astrological Aristotelianism in the mid-19th century? And anybody, anybody can easily learn from the astrology volume of Fuerzes Gives Geschichte des Arabischen Schriftums, astrology continued to fascinate people. On the one hand, what followed was an extremely productive period in which numerous Muslim Arab authors composed treatises on astrology. More and more astrological texts were translated and made available to Arab readers, and all this was probably, probably presumably also read by a continuously growing uh, audience. But this is only one side of the problem. Let us look at how astrology was conceived in the intellectual discourse of the time, especially among the so-called Hellenized um, intellectual elites, those who were really interested in um, Greek sciences. As you probably all know, our main sources of information for the adaptation and appropriation of Greek sciences in the Muslim Arab world are the so-called classification of the sciences, a literary, literary genre which served numerous Arabic authors of the 9th and 10th century and even afterwards as a kind of literary means to produce some kinds of encyclopedic survey uh, of the newly absorbed scientific knowledge and or to create some kind of uh, teaching or learning curriculum for, um, for students. As Dimitri Gutas has shown in an article published in 1983, these specifications of sciences ultimately all rely on models adopted from introductory works produced for the philosophical schools in Alexandria and late antiquity. Now, what can we learn from these texts about the history of astrology? First of all, without exception, None of the Greek philosophical schools in antiquity included astrology into their study program. Therefore, it is quite surprising to see that almost all Arabic adaptations assigned to astrology a place in their classification of the sciences. This fact in itself can be seen as evidence for the growing importance of astrology as the growing importance astrology assumed in the intellectual discourse in the Arab world during that period of time. I think, however, that this picture is in a way one-sided and slightly misleading. Admittedly, astrology was included into the system of sciences by the Arabs, together with other sciences, like medicine, which also normally were not included in the models from late antiquity either. But as we will see in a minute, this inclusion of astrology does not necessarily mean that the respective authors of these enumeration of sciences indeed assume a federal, favorable stance towards astrology. A closer look will rather reveal that in spite of the formal inclusion of astrology among the other sciences, astrology was often severely criticized and did not full, uh, receive full-scale support from the philosophers or theologians unless they were astro astrologers themselves. One of the first Muslim authors to include astrology among the sciences was the Persian mathematician al who lived from 780 to 850. He discusses astrology in one of his chapter, chapters of his book, Fahal Ulum, the key of the sciences, together with astronomy and uh, another chapter on astronomical instruments. al however, was not a very critical spirit, and he seems to have been quite content to just provide some basic information about the different sciences, which he divides in general into indigene and exogene sciences, and astrology, of course, belongs to the newly imported exogene sciences, foreign sciences. Uh, but close to nothing can be learned about the scientific character and the epistemological status of astrology. In a much more systematic and definitely more critical manner, this was done a bit later, by the 10th century philosopher Al Farabi, 872 to 950. In his famous and really very much studied and apparently also 
translated many times into several times into Latin and so on. His famous enumeration of the sciences, Sada and Rum. And Farabi again discusses astrology and astronomy together under the heading The Science of the Stars. But he makes a clear difference between the two parts. And I quote That what is, what is known by this name is two sciences. One of them is the science of the judgments of the stars, and this is the science of the portents of the stars about what will happen in the future and about many things that now exist and about many things that happened before. And the second one is the mathematical science of the stars. And this one is the one which is accounted among the sciences and among the teachings. And regarding the formal one, this is rather counted among the faculties and arts by which man is able to give warnings about what will happen similar to the interpretation of dreams and the crawling and the flying of birds and similar things. Now, at first sight, at sight this sounds like a pretty fair attitude towards astrology. A Farabi not only integrates traditional astrology into a system of science, but also defines its scope and its relation to astronomy in pretty clear and convincing terms. A closer look at this text and a comparison with other one, other texts and works of Al-Farabi reveals, however, that behind Al-Farabi's apparent objectivity lays hidden a severe criticism regarding astrology's scientific value. According to Al-Farabi, what characterizes traditional astrology in contrast to scientific astronomy is its purely technical character, which renders it into a practical art rather than a deductive science in the strict sense of the word. The full polemical force of this specific characterization of astrology becomes clear only if one compares it um, with what he is writing about astrology in some of his other works, especially in his uh, um, work on aspects in which the belief of astrology is valid, the Nukhat Adinasakti, Maya Sokhom, or Malaya Sokhom, Menachanatu Nuzum. In the later text, Al-Farabi is, first of all, in agreement with all the Aristotelian thinkers of the Middle Ages that the celestial bodies do exert some kind of influence on terrestrial bodies. But the crucial question which Al-Farabi raises is whether, the, whether it is at all possible to get any kind of scientific knowledge about this influence. Scientific knowledge in the Aristotelian sense of the word, of course. In order to find this out, Al-Farabi embarks on a long and detailed discussion about the possibilities and limitations of gaining knowledge about possible future events or things that happen accidentally, future contingents. He then scrutinizes in detail the physical basis of the influence of celestial bodies upon terrestrial bodies and comes to the conclusion that in those cases, the causal relationship between astral cause and terrestrial effect is too remote in order to allow, allow for any kind of reliable scientific statement. Moreover, he detects in the commonly held astrological doctrines, concepts, and ideas which bluntly contradict some of the most fundamental assumptions of Aristotelian physics, such as the attribution of qualities to the planets which refers to the theory of the fifth or incorruptible matter. Element. So that astrology loses in his eyes much of its physical foundations. In the end, it appears that conjectures about the influence of the positions of the stars on certain events are just like as likely as those of other popular divinatory practices like eye watching and bird flights and so on. Astrology would have to take into account too many different relevant aspects, which it doesn't come to in order to work properly. So that Al-Farabi concludes that astrology is in the end of the day nothing more than conjecture, supposition, smooth talk, and deception. This is briefly summarized Al-Farabi's characterization of astrology. What occasioned this rupture between the two branches of the science of the stars, and more importantly, between astrology and <coughs> philosophy, uh, after the heydays, a century before, in the circle of opinion. We do not really know for sure, but I think that the most likely answer is that it was nothing else but the deeper and more systematic acquaintance with both Aristotelian physics and the, his uh, philosophy of science, which made this divorce unavoidable. 
the rift of synthesis of astrology and Aristotelianism initiated a century earlier by Akindi and Abu Mashar was too fragile in order to survive more systematic scrutiny. A deeper acquaintance with Aristotle's physics made it impossible to believe in the superficial harmony between the two, and perhaps more importantly, the reception of Aristotle's theory of scientific knowledge, such as found in the newly translated Analytica Posteriora, made it impossible, if impossible, to blindly apply the empiricist interpretation of metaphysics A. Alpha. Accordingly, the inclusion of astrology in Alpharabi's enumeration of the sciences must not be interpreted naively as, as evidence for a growing esteem for the science, for this science by an individual author. It rather reflects a sophisticated attempt to enter into a discussion about the specific scientific value of astrology and to allot it its proper place in the system of sciences. And it should be remembered that at the very beginning of this text, Aparabi says himself, the aim of my book here is to describe the sciences and to give you also the keys to evaluate them, to say which science is more certain and which one is less certain. And uh, since we are here in, in Chicago, I want to add one remark, uh, which perhaps might lead the interpretation of this text into a, to a totally different direction. What I've described here is at least what arises from, a, from, the, from the exoteric meaning of the words of, of, of Alfarabi's treatise. Only in parenthesis, I would like to mention here that there is perhaps one more aspect which would turn all this upside down. Pretty much at the beginning of this, of this text, of this Alfarabi's text on the criticism of where it criticizes astrology, Alfarabi states that the stars are in fact the cause of those things which happen accidentally and that cannot be grasped by any scientific method. That's what he says. To this paragraph, however, he adds another one, which seemingly leaves the discussion about the scientific value of astrology um, and moves to the political Islam. And here, Al-Farab points out that the fact that there are things which happen accidentally and which remain unpredictable has enormous political importance because otherwise people would lose their fear and would no longer obey God and the political leaders. So we, astrology, if it would work, would do harm because people would no longer obey God and the political leaders. This is a quite surprising statement because what Al-Farabi is actually saying here is that irrespective of the question whether scientific astrology is possible, it is always preferable, from a political point of view, that no such knowledge exists among common people. Now, based upon, based upon this statement, one can think about a quite different political reading of the whole treatise about, on astrology, a reading which, in a way, follows Straussian lines of Leo Strauss. What if Al-Farabi's reputation of astrology is not at all motivated or at least not in the first place, by scientific consideration, but rather by political ones. What does it mean for the interpretation of the text of Al-Farabi's um, main message is that normal people, Al-Ama, should not gain certain knowledge of future events? So in that case, what about the learned one? The philosophers. Can they and should they try to gain this knowledge, this astronomical knowledge? If this Straussian interpretation were correct, Alfarabi's whole argument would, of course, appear in totally different light. I do not want to defend this reading here explicitly, but I think that it should be taken into consideration that this is at least a possible direction of the interpretation of this text. A more penetrating study of Alfarabi's treatise on astrology will have to ask, I think, whether the elitist scientific impossibility of astrology is indeed as absolute and uncompromising as it might seem at first sight. And, of course, to ask what kind of consequences that would have. But be this as it may, at least arguably, the philosophical reputation of astrology became standard in Muslim Arab Aristotelianism. A similar stance, like Al-Farabi's, was taken, for example, by the second important Aristotelian philosopher in the Arab Arabic language, Ibn Sina, who lived from 1980 to 1033. 
He made his doubts about the reliability of the visual astrology explicit in the work exclusively dedicated to the reputation of astrology, the Risala the Ettal Kamalajuk. In a quite political way, he divides the branches of new human knowledge into two. Those sciences, sciences which cannot be criticized because they are evident, and those which must not be criticized because they are unworthy of any kind of criticism. Astrology, it does not saying, of course, belongs to the second one. In spite of this heuristic statement, however, but apparently because of the enormous influence of astrology, Vincina does make the effort to refute astrology on different levels. First, he believes it to be, similarly to, to Ostomy, nothing but a child of men's wishful thinking. People try to overcome their fears and try to satisfy their, their personal desires, and so are naturally inclined to believe in alchemy and astrology. Secondly, in the main part of astrologies, even Sina then criticizes in detail all the fundamental astrological doctrines from the perspective of an Aristotelian physics, and argues that unlike medicine, which does have its foundations in true scientific practices, astrology is not built upon such a sound scientific ground. The latter argument must have been of special importance to Ibn Sina because Muslim Arab astrologers from Akindi onward often compared their science to medicine in order to underpin the reliability of, and the scientific character of astrology. And secondly, because Ibn Sina himself, as it is well known, spent much energy on formulating the foundation, the scientific foundations of a strictly scientific medicine in Aristotelian terms in his famous Kanun Titit, the canon of medicine. At the end of the treatise, he would see that it highlights the impossibility of astrology in view of the multiplicity of astral factors and terrestrial conditions. Now again, in view of this devastating critique, it is again interesting to see that also even Sina includes astrology in his own work on the classification of sciences. The Risala, the Aksam, the Ulum, al Aqliya, the Epistle, on the parts of Russian sciences. The model he is adopting here is quite different from what we have seen in Alkindi, Alkhoresmi, and Alkhoresmi. Even Sina divides sciences into foundational theoretical sciences, which he calls following uh, uh, terminology from, from Islamic roots, usul, and opposes them to the practical application, which he calls kuru branches. He then subsumes astrology together with other sciences, like medicine, tip, Geomancy, Hirasa, Reinterpretation, Atabir, Talismans, Tatsamat, Magic, Niranjat, and Alchemy, Alchemia, among what he calls the parts of the applied wisdom about nature, Afikma al Fadiya Kabir, as opposed to the branches of Aristotelian physics which represent the teachings about the principles of natural science. Now, there are two interesting points, aspects, in Ibn Sina's new classification of astrology among the applied, if you want, uh, natural sciences. First, whereas Alkindi, Alkhoresmi, and Alfarabi had all seen astrology as being the practical system of astronomy, Ibn, S Ibn Sina disconnects astrology from astronomy, Imadaya, which remains, like in all the other texts, uh, <coughs> Predecessors part of the mathematical sciences and introduces it into applied physics. And secondly, Ibn Sina inserts astrology into a list of sciences, some of which are explicitly connected with, with what he calls occult cause, causes, occult powers, like talismanic arts, about which he says that the aim of talismanic art is the mixture of heavenly powers with the powers of some of the terrestrial bodies in order to compose from this power that causes an abnormal event, the Ilad Hariban, in the terrestrial world. Or he says, and Benzina says about magic, and the aim of this is the mixture of powers and the elements of the terrestrial world so that a power which will happen to be in it and that an abnormal event will come forth from it. In other words, even Sina does not only add talismanic art and magic to astrology in the list of applied natural sciences, something that, at least to the best of my knowledge, was never done before, and he disconnects astrology from its long-term partnership with astronomy. 
he also inserts it into a group of sciences whose common characteristic is their reliance upon the principles of physics and upon secret hidden esoteric powers which exceed the capabilities of scientific investigation. I'm, I have to say that I'm not totally sure whether this means that even Sina himself would have argued that hidden esoteric powers are the foundation of traditional astronomy, astrology, In this point, he remains pretty neutral and said that astrology is dealing a bit here with the inference, the uh, events from the positions and movements of the stars. But I think that we are witness here to a crucial development in the history of astrology. Traditional astrology is no longer primarily seen as a sister of astronomy, a sister that can be criticized on the, science of skeptical, on the basis of skeptical arguments, but still belongs to the same family. But it is brought into the context of another branch of sciences, which forms a group of itself, which cannot be called differently than the called sciences. And the inclusion of astrology within what really was to become one in later periods of its major characteristics to be esoteric or cold. Ibn Sina's reinterpretation of the place of astrology in the system of science did not come out of the group. I'm convinced that Ibn, Ibn Sina rather reflects developments to which he himself was pretty much opposed. Side by side, the more strictly Aristotelian thinkers who opposed the conflation of astrology and Aristotelian sciences we can find, mostly labeled, labeled neoplatonic authors, for whom the marriage between astrology, philosophy, and science was not passé and remained extremely attractive, and also who firmly believe that the occult sciences can and need to be integrated into the system of sciences. As far as I can see, this was nowhere, nowhere this, so to speak, academic, Aristotelian intellectual belief, but these were still serious thinkers who firmly believed in the truth of sciences like astrology and astrology. And they tried to imitate the classifications of the philosophers and adopted them according to their criteria. An example of this, uh, I would like to briefly mention here, are of course the famous brethren of purity, the Ikhwan of the Park, in the 10th century, about whom we are also going to hear more in the course of this conference, who produced a long, long epistle on magic, the last one actually. Um, and in that epistle, um, the, it's not only interesting because of the theory of magic described therein, but also for the present attempt to locate the science of talismans, of astromagic, within the system of the science. The sciences are divided by, by him into four parts or by them, mathematical, physical, natural, psychological, and namusi, traditional esoteric. And the letter contains its parts, alchemy, astrology, magic, and medicine. The author of the epistle explicitly explains that astrology is the basis for magic and talismans, and that the later is the, the later is following the first. Another example of this intellectual trend is the Pitakis, the light of the king of Maslama and Majoriti who lived in the 10th century, who apparently lived in Spain. His book is not only an encyclopedia of magic and most importantly of astromagic, which was also translated into Latin and became a kind of Bible of uh, astromagic. It is also a document for the attempts made, made during this period to develop a comprehensive concept of the workings of astral powers and occult sciences. Trying to characterize this kind of astrological magic, al Majoriti writes in the second chapter of his book, magic, simple, I quote, is something that is difficult to comprehend, and its causes are hidden from the ignorant. This is the case because it is a divine power which is active from preceding, cause, from preceding causes, which are the precondition for its understanding. It is a science which is difficult to grasp. In short, magic is something the cause of which is not accessible to the majority of men, which is too difficult to be found by them. This text leaves no room for doubts that its author was, author was already influenced by the discussions about the epistemological status of the practical natural sciences among Aristotelian thinkers like Ibn Sina and the scientific reputation of astrology. He knows that according to the Aristotelian model, 
certain knowledge of causes is the only guarantee for the creation of the true science. And he knows that this is the weak point of astrology and astronomy. But at the same time, the author of the Tricks is convinced that there are ways to come into grips with the, the theory and practice of this branch of occult science and leave it for a select few to, to carry this out. And according to his opinion, there is no reason to give in to the philosophers and their critique of astrology and magic. So what we observe here is a radically different function and image of astrology from the one which, which we have found so far. The astrology used in the magic in the context of magical handbooks and by the Iguana Safa described here is one which is, on the theoretical level, mainly occupied with secret causes and powers, and it is, on the practical level, a science produced and tra transmitted in small circles of adults. In other words, Following certain ideas found also and already in <coughs> the astrology of the diet of Hakim has become an esoteric science in the double sense of the term. It is a science where the object of knowledge is esoteric and the status of knowledge itself is esoteric too. If we now try to summarize the development of the different characterizations of astrology in Muslim Arab culture so far, we can observe the following trends. After an initial period in which there reigned a great optimism that astrology and Aristotelian sciences can be assimilated to one another, the major Aristotelian representatives of the Greek and Roman translation movement made many, many efforts to remove astrology from the canon of Aristotelian sciences, even in those cases where they apparent, apparently included it into their classification of sciences. On the other hand, Attempts to integrate astrology into the broader framework of sciences did not die out, and both even seen as indirect evidence and sources like the brethren of purity, the one as a fund, the Catholics show that Muslim Arab thinkers continued to think of astrology as part of a distinct group of sciences which was to become the occult sciences or the esoteric knowledge. What remained, however, I think was the deep rupture that continued to exist between orthodox Aristotelianism on the one hand side and astrology on the other. This, at least, seems to have been the case in the self-perception of the day philosophers, which did not prevent external critics of Aristotelian philosophy to continue to see astrology and Aristotelian philosophy as close allies. And with this, I would like to conclude my uh, talk this afternoon. Whereas Aristotelian philosophers generally discard astrology, especially critics from among the Buddha Kalimun, Muslim theologians, still had the suspicion that the difference between the two was not as uh, substantial and deep rooted as it might seem. And it wasn't sufficiently clear. A good example for this is Al Bakilani's Kitab at he died in 2013. Um, which comprises next to a chapter on the refutation of the concept of natural causality according to Aristotelian science, another one which presents, represents the refutation of the astrologers and the naturalistic explanation for coming to be in corruption and the occurrence of other physical phenomena in the secondary sphere. This continued association of astrology with the Aristotelian philosophy on polemical grounds, <coughs> which it seems to me became a running point of the Kalam criticism of Greek thinking, deserves a more thorough investigation than what can be done here. I would like to mention, however, that this general trend had even repercussions among, repercussions among Jewish writers. I think here of Judah Halevi, who writes in the opening lines of the fifth book of the Sefer Kuzari which deals with a detailed criticism and examination of Aristotelian concepts and Kalam uh, concepts and Avicennian philosophy. And there he writes, I quote, Where do we find a soul which is sufficiently strong not to be deceived by the opinions that occur to it, like the opinions of the naturalists, Atabi'i, the astrologers, Mujahideen, the producers of talismans, Mujahideen, the sorcerers, Sukhara, the eternalists, Dahirin, the philosophers, Mutafalsafin, and so on. It could be argued that this list of foes of religion is 
just a randomly assembled collection of labels which do not have anything in common. Just as we could say, well, I am against communism and fascism and terrorism and uh, I don't know what. Um, I think, however, that there is more in it. But for the Muslim and Jewish theologians, astrology, which was brought into Muslim Arab culture, not only together with all the other sciences, but also together with Aristotelian philosophy, for the theologians, the connection was between astrology and philosophy was never really uh, forgotten. Astrology and philosophy remained twins which both, both need to be formed. Now, I have tried here to give a very rough sketch of the different ways how astrology was characterized in the Muslim Arab world in this circles which were connected to the translation. Astrology, which was imported as part of the huge Greco Arabic translation movement, in different groups at different times, astrology received quite different treatments and was characterized in many, many different ways. What we can learn from these sources is that in a way, astrology was part of the scientific heritage of the ancient world that reached the Arabs, in which the Arabs developed in the most creative ways. What can be said, however, is, is that astrology, what, what cannot be said, however, is that astrology was just science like any other science. Not in history and not today. But this is probably what makes astrology into such a just interesting and fascinating subject for historians. And this basic characteristic of astrology, to be a science unlike all other sciences, reassures us that a fascinating conference is going to await us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions, starting with how it is. Yeah. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Um, I wonder if you can help me understand uh, a certain distinction between Kindi and Farabi and uh, Ibn Sina. So Kindi on the one hand, Kindi and Abu Mahshad on the one hand, and then Ibn Sina and um, Farabi on the other. If I understood you correctly, you were saying that for Kindi, the way that the um, astrological, the way that astrology was incorporated into Aristotelian thought was through the category of Tashrabat. So, so Tashrabat, and I'm Am I understanding correctly that Teshuvah was the, the method through which um, astrologers mm. did their work? So if, if, if that is correct, um, isn't that a shared component between the way that Farabi and Ibn Sina also understood um, astrology? And if that's the case, then isn't a problem of astrology, uh, isn't the way, you know, the way that astrology is to be judged through whether um, uh, the extent to which Tejaba methodical experience or um, you know, testing and, yeah. and trying and so on, the extent to which that epistemologically is valid. Um, and, and, and how can we understand the problems around this question of Tejaba comparatively, maybe in relation to something like medicine? I mean, I understand what all sciences have, you know, they, they, they you know, it's the, the problem of sort of the hiddenness and the causes and so on. But even when the philosophers are talking about medicine, often there's this question, I mean, in the right? The, the question of scanning and purging bile, the issue is that we don't know what the cause yeah. exactly yeah. is. It's a hidden, you know, ultimately we come up with a hidden syllogism. You know, we think of it as a purger, but we don't know exactly how it happens. So to that extent, is there not really much more of a similarity with a field like medicine? And, you know, so what is, what is the status of of experience as a kind of thing. Is that sort of lightning rod here? Yeah. Um, I think two things. The imminent place of uh, astrology within the system of Aristotelian science is actually its value for filling the systematic gap with interstellar physics, which is one thing. Yeah, that, that actually, according to Joshua Akindi and Abu Mashar, um, Astrology explains the, the functioning of the, especially the influence of the, of the sun, but of, of the celestial bodies in general upon uh, terrestrial bodies. That's one thing. And uh, I think that this is the main reason why, why you really 
uh, or how he tries to, to, to stress the importance of, of the, the, the description of astrology as a kind of a mistress of the sciences, at least of physical sciences in, uh, in Akini. This is one thing that I think that must be kept separately from, from the second point, which is uh, Akini's um, interpretation of astrology as a science in, in, in a strategic terms. And, and here it, it is correct that there is a kind of uh, continuity between, between Akindi and Akindi also actually argues that astrology just like medicine is based upon Tata River. What um, um, I was actually, uh, what I'm actually thinking about the, the historical geochronic development here is it's actually a little bit opposite to what normally historians of, of Muslim uh, Arabic philosophy think. We have the, both in Al-Farabi and in, in Ibn Sina discussions about Tajriba. And it is normally interpreted as, uh, as an addition to, um, to the Aristotelian uh, axiomatic concept of science. I think that in view of what we can learn from the discussion in Akindi and the disputes between Akindi and Al-Farabi, especially in the field of the strong it's actually the other way around. There was an empiricist reading of the Aristotelian concept of science, which had to be adapted to the new findings which, uh, which, made, which the, the, the reading of the analytical posteriori made necessary. So, so the, I think that, that the, the, the relevant passages that both in al farabi and in, uh, in Ibn Sina are actually have to be read not from the perspective of how Arabs added Tajriba to Aristotelian science, but how to the uh, Tajriba interpretation, the empiricist interpretation of Aristotle, al farabi and, and Ibn Sina added the newly acquired uh, knowledge about the analytical posterior. That's the way I, I, I read this thing, and I think that, that in, in that concept, even from a, from a more general point of view, the, the familiarity of, um, of Akindi with, uh, with, the, with the metaphysics and the first chapter of the book Alpha of metaphysics is really crucial, because this um, uh, is a discussion about, uh, about um, empirical sciences, and the, the starting point was, was actually this concept of empirical sciences. Reliable science, 
actually the Aristotelian philosopher would be the better uh, fortune teller than the prophet. And then that would, of course, uh, uh, cause enormous discussions. And, and on the other way, the other way around, actually, the, the one of the basic problems of as far as I can see of, uh, of the, the, the Kalam criticism of Aristotelian philosophy and, and the concept of causality is based upon this kind of religious. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderfully rich and very talk. I wonder if, if one attempted to write the history of astrology in this period, not within intellectual history and the history of science, but rather the popular history and non intellectual history, what resources would be available to do that and how different the picture would emerge? Um. Second lecture. <laughs> I mean, that's explicitly what I, what I didn't want to talk about in the lecture. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I said it in the beginning, but I, uh, I have another one. But no. But um, um, actually, what, what would be very interesting would really to um, to ask the question to which extent popular astrology has a potential of innovation in view of changing social conditions, because uh, that was actually one of the, that's not really, not connected to what I've, I've said today, that uh, there is a, a fascinating um, conservatism in popular astrology. If you, if you there, there are already studies from, from a century ago by Bitzold and, uh, and other um, um, Cuneiform scholars who actually pointed out that, that we find in, in Mesopotamia from the first, second millennium BC texts which are, according to the content and literary form, almost identical with like what we find in popular astrology in the Hellenistic world and later in the Roman period, the texts that were copied later on in, uh, in the Byzantine period, texts of which we had later on translations into. Junior Aramaic into Syria, from there into whatever. And actually, continuity of 3,000, 4,000 years of text. Actually, one of the most interesting questions in that respect would be to ask whether, in addition to this conservative, there is also potential, potential innovation. Um, what you can find out in this field is the question where actually astrology of this kind is. Um, Socially located, now you can you can find um, in, in the field which I've, which I've studied in, uh, in popular astrology and in, in Jewish sources, what is called popular astrology, that in certain contexts you can say it's popular astrology, but in other contexts you can see, for example, that these texts were copied in uh, in the synagogue prayer books in the Machzorim, and the appendices to to the to the prayer books which were. The, how in the in, in the synagogues, where you can, you can see well that wasn't popular. That was knowledge which was considered to be part of the knowledge of the whole community, and it's inappropriate to call it actually popular knowledge in that sense. This would be the kind of question which I which I would, would ask in that respect. But that was not the so what uh, you began with Buddha and his uh, characterization of astrology as the mistress of the science, queen of the sciences, which he uh, adopted from uh, from Theophilus. Uh, so can you just elaborate more on um, why he pushes that idea and how he gets it on? Buddha. Yeah. Well, I think that it's um, as I said. I mean, Buddha tries to, to, and actually I only um, understood this when I, when I, when I reread this book for, for, for this paper, that uh, he, not really a Marxist, but a kind of left-wing kind of historiography. Historic, historiography, which is not a uh, historiography of uh, history of ideas, 
but one which is interested in, in social development in the economical, political, social motives of the development of ideas. And, and I think that, that uh, what he does actually is to combine this general methodological approach with the, with the objective historical evidence which we do have that there are very early translations of astrological texts, that we have the, the historical evidence that, uh, um, that already at the turn of the, the century astrological texts were translated into Arabic long before we have these uh, the schools of, of uh, philosophers. And, and out of these two elements, I think, he, he created his, uh, his theory, kind of materialistic historiographical theory together with uh, combined with his evidence. That's what I think how, how the theory came, came into being. And why is it wrong? What? And how is it so wrong? How is it so wrong since there was the theory? I was, was it so? Why is, he, why is that such a mistake in his representation of the early history of astrology? Uh, I see what he's doing, he's combining social history with economic history with intellectual history. But why, uh, you said he overstates the claim and this is the point. He, he, because because I, I think that, um, well, in the first place I, I don't think that, uh, that it is necessary to, to pinpoint one science which was attractive and which actually dragged behind it the, the interest in all the other sciences. And um, and I, and more of that, I don't think that we really have, every, as, as far as I can see, in, uh, for Akinia it's perhaps true, but, but for, 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 for Ravi, I don't think that, uh, that astrology played or the, 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 the defense or uh, reputation of astrology be a major factor in, in their philosophical interests. I think that, uh, that that this would be a kind of uh, over estimation of, the, of this, this factor. Right? I think that I don't know. I, I think that, that it's, it's not the, the, the picture which he's drawing is not, uh, not totally convincing. Although it's, it's 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 interesting. I mean, it's interesting that he does so, and it's also interesting that he actually. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, he never really discussed the second second option, which was predominant previously, that, that it was must have been medicine, which is actually more, uh, in a way, more, more more convincing because I mean we all are ill at a certain time. Not all of us consult astrologers all the time, but um, yeah, it's just a shift of paradigm, which is remarkable for each one. Thank you very much. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.